Sacred Spaces was made possible with generous contributions from Carl H. Lindner, the Ohio Humanities Council, the Josephine S. Russell Charitable Trust, the Fine Arts Fund, GBBN Architects, and with generous support from CET and the Voyager Media Group production team. They're touchstones, echoing changing waves of history. They're symbols rising above our city streets, testaments to time. They're expressions of mastery in architecture, craft, and art. Sacred spaces are the spiritual heart of our community. Places where people come together to share the most important events of their lives. In Greater Cincinnati, houses of worship are among our oldest and most beautiful buildings, representing our rich architectural legacy and a wealth of religious art. From the simple churches of early Christian immigrants to the modern-day mosques of recently immigrated Muslims, sacred spaces stand as witnesses, telling the story of who we are, how we settled, how we've changed, and how we've grown. Over two dozen are listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Countless others are treasured landmarks that help to shape the image and identity of our neighborhoods. Join us as we reveal the extraordinary beauty of some of Greater Cincinnati's most important sacred spaces and explore their history, their design, and their place in our communities. Sacred domes and spires punctuate the rolling hills of the Ohio River Valley, evidence that religious experience has long been important in our community life. American Indians built the oldest sacred spaces in Greater Cincinnati beginning about 3,000 years ago. Tens of thousands of ancient conical mounds, hilltop enclosures, and geometric earthworks once dotted the central Ohio Valley. Some have been preserved, but most like the mounds once located in the basin of Cincinnati, have been lost to time and development. As soon as the first European settlers came by flatboat to the region, they began to build churches and sites of prominence. Pioneer Park near Lunkin Airport in the East End marks the site of the first settlement and the first church. Major Benjamin Stites and other first settlers built the Columbia Baptist Church in 1792. That church was also used by Presbyterians, who had congregations in Columbia and downriver in Losantaville, which became Cincinnati. Presbyterians and other Protestant congregations in Cincinnati built their first churches on 4th Street. The 19th century urban skyline wasn't defined by skyscrapers. It was defined by church steeples and a few factory smokestacks. So the establishment of churches, particularly along 4th Street, was very important. Christ Church gets established as the Episcopal congregation on 4th Street very, very early. Christ Church Episcopalian Cathedral, still on 4th Street, traces its roots to 1817 and some of Cincinnati's earliest and most influential residents. The current cathedral, built to replace an historic Gothic structure, includes Tiffany windows from that older church. The Centennial Chapel offers an intimate setting for smaller services. As our cities grew, so did our churches. In the mid-19th century, Cincinnati was the fastest growing city in the United States. Many Irish came to the area, followed by a large influx from the region now known as Germany. Germany doesn't exist until 1870. 
These are people who are coming from a variety of German-speaking states in Central Europe. They don't think of themselves as coming from Germany. They don't think of themselves as German as such until they get here and they find themselves up against the American society that they suddenly find themselves sort of dropped into. The arrival of so many immigrants brought about what might be considered the golden age of sacred architecture in the region. A remarkable cluster of sacred spaces was formed near the corner of Plum and 8th Streets. The Unitarian Church on the northeast corner is gone, but three of our most magnificent sacred spaces are still there, meticulously preserved. Covenant First Presbyterian Church, St. Peter and Chains Cathedral, and Plum Street Temple. Together with Cincinnati City Hall, these structures created an important civic and social center in the heart of the city. So what you end up with is this wonderful statement of groups of people trying to figure out what it means to be American and what it means to be church and state in America on this wonderful corner. Covenant First Presbyterian Church faces Elm Street and crowns the view from Pyatt Park. It sits back to back with Plum Street Temple. Covenant First is designed in the high Victorian Gothic architectural style and displays a tripartite feature found in many Christian churches. So there are three major divisions to the facade. There's the entrance gable over the porch and then there's a tower on either side. But the porch itself is divided into three parts. And this is obvious symbolism of the Trinity, uh, the Christian Trinity of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And it's been a feature of Christian architecture ever since at least old St. Peter's in Rome in the fourth century. This whole facade echoes those of the great French cathedrals, Gothic cathedrals, such as Chartres. And um, this form was also echoed in most uh, of the great English cathedrals. Covenant First traces its roots to one of Cincinnati's earliest congregations. The result of the divisions and mergers of seven churches, it's the only Presbyterian church currently remaining downtown. The merged congregations included the Second Presbyterian Church, where the renowned preacher Lyman Beecher, father of Harriet Beecher Stowe and president of Lane Theological Seminary, was pastor from 1833 to 1843. Lyman Beecher, of course, he had a galvanizing personality in the sense of uh, had a lot of uh, fervor and dedication and drive and so on that made him of note in New England. Now, he spent most of his life in New England, but he was, along with Presbyterians, very desirous to bring the Christian worship and the doctrines of the Presbyterian Church. The unusual floor plan of Covenant First resembles the 17th century Gothic tithe barns of the Scottish English border country. I remember myself the first time I came into the Covenant First Presbyterian being absolutely startled because I assumed that ahead of me, I knew it was a long, fairly narrow urban church, would be the altar at the far end. Instead, we had what is, I think, very appropriately called an English tithe barn. It's a vast, high ceiling rectangular space with the focus not at the far end and divided into three parts, but on the side, so that you're forced to change angle or axis as you come in. The purpose of this unusual orientation to the side rather than the end is probably to reinforce the sense of Protestantism. Covenant First displays beautiful furniture and woodwork that reflects Cincinnati's pioneering role in the arts and crafts movement during the 1870s. Two impressive chairs in the church once belonged to the wealthy merchant John Chilito. Henry Fry and his son William Fry, nationally known artists, carved the pulpit furniture from black walnut. The furniture is really very architectural. It looks almost like miniature shrines as well as thrones. Characteristic of the early aesthetic movement aspects of the arts and crafts, the surfaces of the furniture are just completely covered with carving. <laughs> 
Stained glass windows with geometric patterns in a Victorian style date back to the early 1870s. The church also has beautiful memorial windows donated by prominent families of the church. Several of the windows, and I suspect all of these early 20th century windows, were designed and painted by Frank Zinser of Cincinnati. We do tend to think that great windows had to be from elsewhere, from Tiffany in New York, from Munich in Germany for mostly Catholic churches, but in fact we've always had, since at least the Civil War, quite important stained glass manufacturing. A special bell adds to everything that makes Covenant First one of Cincinnati's truly unique sacred spaces. The bell was cast at the foundry of Paul Revere in Boston. St. Peter and Chains Cathedral is considered one of the outstanding Greek revival buildings in the country. It features numerous artistic treasures. Murals by Carl Zimmerman, sculptures by Robert Kepnick and Ernest Bruce Haswell, and the focal point, a large Byzantine-style gold mosaic. The mosaic is made from thousands of pieces of handcrafted Venetian glass over a 24-karat gold leaf background. The Greek Revival architecture inspired the style for the Stations of the Cross. The artist modeled the designs after Greek pottery of the 6th to 4th century BC. The muralist here in the cathedral is Carl Zimmermann. And Carl Zimmermann actually represents a long line of German muralists and other German craftsmen who exercised their arts here in the Cincinnati region between 1820 and 1960. And with this influx of German immigrants, not only do we have a wonderful collection of murals, but also woodworking, metal sculpture, and stained glass windows. The cathedral was built just 24 years after the first Catholic church in Cincinnati, a simple wood frame structure built in 1821. St. Francis Seraph now occupies the site of that church at the corner of Liberty and Vine Streets. In 1826, the growing Catholic population built its first cathedral on Sycamore between 6th and 7th Streets, where St. Xavier Church now stands. The Catholic population swelled in the 1830s and 40s with the influx of immigrants. Bishop John Purcell, himself an Irish immigrant who'd been in the country less than 25 years, seized the opportunity to build a new cathedral, St. Peter in Chains. He wanted to build the cathedral in the neo gratian style because that is the style that was used for government buildings in Washington, D.C. And he wanted to prove to his fellow citizens that Catholics, no matter what their ethnic origin, were as loyal citizen as anyone else in the United States. It is very difficult for people, whether they're Catholic or not, to imagine that being Catholic was seen as a threat at one point. It was actually seen as a characteristic that made it impossible for a person to ever become a good American. So in the mid-1830s, when Lyman Beecher has been invited to come out and take over the presidency of Lane Seminary, he writes his daughter Catherine, I am contemplating going to Cincinnati because the whole American experiment is on the line. The flood of Catholic immigrants threatens to undermine America. If we can save the great valley of the Ohio at Cincinnati, we can save America. At the time it was built, St. Peter and Chains was one of the largest buildings in the city of Cincinnati. And as the river boats were coming up and down the river, it is said that they could see the spire of the cathedral from 10 miles off. In the late 19th century, people began to move to new hilltop suburbs, and conditions in the basin declined. And as the population base began to decline, so did the fabric of the cathedral. It fell into disrepair. 
it was in such a bad state of disrepair that it was actually condemned by the city of Cincinnati because the floorboards had rotted out. So in 1938, despite the magnificence of its architecture, Archbishop John McNicholas decided St. Peter and Chains would no longer serve as the Catholic Cathedral. He gave that designation to St. Monica Church in Clifton. St. Monica's incorporates Byzantine and Romanesque forms and sculptures by Clement Barnhorn and his students. The architect, Edward J. Schulte, was nationally renowned for his church designs. But St. Peter and Chains wouldn't be neglected for long. After his installation in 1950, Archbishop Carl J. Alter announced that the former cathedral would be restored. His decision was encouraged in part by the city of Cincinnati's 1948 master plan that called for the rebirth of downtown. So the back wall has exploded, it's increased in size, it is reimagined on the interior from an architectural point of view, and this becomes the new center for the archdiocese. And it's very important that it was going to be in the center of the city. The cathedral was renovated and expanded by Edward Schulte and rededicated in 1957 with much fanfare and celebration. It continues to maintain its status as a treasured Cincinnati landmark. Plum Street Temple is considered the finest example of Moorish Byzantine Gothic architecture in the Western world and one of the masterpieces of James K. Wilson, a great Cincinnati native architect from the Civil War period. It sits directly opposite St. Peter and Chains on Plum Street. Plum Street Temple has great significance for Reform Judaism and American Judaism today, uh, both historic significance and symbolic significance. First of all, it's one of our oldest buildings in American Jewish life. That alone would, would make it important. Its beauty is really unparalleled, and the style of architecture, there's a uniqueness to it. Beyond that, it represents, as does Cincinnati, the fountainhead of Reform Judaism. Cincinnati's first Jewish residents arrived from England in the early 1800s. In 1824, they founded B'nai Israel. The congregation, still in Cincinnati at Rockdale Temple in Amberley Village, followed the traditions of Orthodox Judaism. Plum Street Temple was built by B'nai Yashurin, a congregation that had been organized by German-American Jews who wanted a different type of ritual. In 1854, Rabbi Isaac M. Wise came to lead B'nai Yashurin. Rabbi Wise brought about revolutionary change that reached beyond the congregation in Cincinnati to all of Judaism in the United States. Raised in a traditional Jewish home in Bohemia, Wise became familiar with Reform Judaism as it was emerging in Europe and brought knowledge of it with him to America. In the 1850s, when the leadership of this congregation had determined that they wanted to um, embrace Reform Judaism, they contacted Isaac Mayer Wise, who had already gained a reputation nationally, and his response was that he would become the rabbi here if he were elected rabbi for life. This is before he had met them or they had met him. So it was a bit of what we call in Yiddish chutzpah, but in fact, it was really an instant marriage. He found an environment here among the leadership that embraced not only Reform Judaism for themselves, but also his dream of establishing uh, this new kind of Judaism and establishing a seminary, an American rabbinical seminary which became the Hebrew Union College. When Rabbi Wise came to Cincinnati, the B'nai Yeshurun congregation included about 200 families. With the building of Plum Street Temple, they created a sanctuary that could hold 1,100. So clearly he had a, a grand sense in his mind, both in what we see in the scope, the size of this building, and, and, and the majesty of it, that Reform Judaism would be helping to usher in a new golden age of Jewish life that America would be the new golden age, as just as Spain had been until the 15th century. And uh, he was right. He was absolutely uh, visionary in that way. Jewish law prohibits the use of any human or animal form in a synagogue, 
lest it be misconstrued as an idol or representation of God. Yet the interior of Plum Street Temple is an incredible display of color and form. It has elaborate stenciling supervised by Francis Pedretti, an important local artist whose frescoes graced many area churches, commercial buildings, and homes. Instrumental music was not part of traditional Jewish services before Rabbi Wise introduced it here. John H. Kenkin, renowned for building pipe organs all over the region, built the Rockwern organ at Plum Street Temple. With over 3,000 pipes, the organ is one of the largest and most intact pipe organs left in Greater Cincinnati. Though silent for over a decade, the organ is making music once again since being restored in 2005. Although the congregation moved to new quarters in Amberley Village, it continues to own, use, and meticulously maintain this national historic landmark. We regard this sanctuary as just the gem of Jewish life and our gem to safeguard and to protect and to enjoy, like any precious gem that you may be fortunate enough to inherit. It takes a tremendous amount of work, as you can imagine. So that, I think, gives some measure of a sense of the love that we have for the historic obligation and privilege that we feel this building to be. North of the old Miami and Erie Canal, a new neighborhood known as Over the Rhine took shape in the mid-1800s. As the center of German immigrant life, brick row houses, beer halls, and church towers dominated. Old St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church on 12th Street in Over the Rhine is Cincinnati's oldest surviving church building. The cornerstone was laid in 1841. The building of the church was a hands-on construction project done by these immigrants. They were very, very qualified artisans and craftsmen, while the men chopped the timbers in the Pendleton Woods for the crisscross beams in this building. The ladies were busy baking the bricks in their ovens. The handsome Greek Revival exterior gives little hint of the elaborate interior. Decorated with carved woodwork and statuary, and paintings by Wilhelm Lamprecht and Anton Muller. Recent restoration at Old St. Mary's revealed faux finishes and other artwork that had been hidden for decades. Before the renovations were done, many, many years of candle smoke and, and, and dirt from in the area was covering a lot of the artwork. Some of it was hardly discernible in the front of the church. We had to light up some of the rondelles so that people could see them and they came out gloriously in the restoration. But what really, really amazes us is on Palm Sunday when we had just done the ceiling, everyone assumed it's just a flat painted ceiling. Once it was cleaned, the trompe l'oeil style of depth perception just popped right into your eye. The socially prominent congregations in Over the Rhine clustered around Washington Park. The land originally served as burial grounds for Episcopal, Presbyterian, and German Protestant churches. Cincinnati's leading German Protestant congregation built St. John's German Protestant Church in 1867 at the corner of 12th and Elm. On the east side of the park, two substantial stone structures remain. Nast Trinity United Methodist Church was designed by Samuel Hannaford and named in honor of Wilhelm Nast, the founder of both German Methodism and this congregation. Nearby is the first English Lutheran church, established by prominent German Protestants who wish to worship in English. The church is designed according to the Akron Plan, a layout developed in the late 19th century in Akron, Ohio. The Akron Plan is designed to accommodate the needs of the Sunday school. Folding doors or movable partitions separated or joined classrooms that surrounded the main sanctuary. Completed in 1894, First Lutheran was designed by architects Crapsey and Brown. Crapsey and Brown really dominated the field of Protestant Akron Plan church design, not only in the Cincinnati area, but throughout the Midwest.
Like Cincinnati, Covington, Kentucky is renowned for many significant sacred structures. First United Methodist Church, at the corner of Fifth and Greenup, has survived despite damage from both fire and tornado in the 20th century. Philanthropists Amos and Sarah Schinkel financed construction of the church. William Walter and William Stewart, architects responsible for notable churches on both sides of the river, designed it. First Baptist Church on 4th Street is another of Covington's historic and well-preserved sacred treasures. It too was designed by Walter and Stewart. Trinity Episcopal Church at the corner of 4th and Madison was organized in 1842. In a series of alterations led by prominent Victorian architects including William Tinsley, William Stewart, and Louis Piquet, the church gradually evolved into a long L-shaped form. Trinity Episcopal contains an incredible collection of Cincinnati art carvings created by churchwomen who were trained by the prominent artist and teacher Ben Pittman, a competitor to Henry and William Fry. The church also contains beautiful stained glass, including a unique Tiffany window that has fading Gothic arches to create an illusory transept where the actual church site doesn't allow for one. Mother of God Catholic Church is the centerpiece of the Muttergotus National Historic District. It was founded as the first German Catholic Church in Northern Kentucky. And right about that time, we know that about 200 German Catholics were arriving per day in the Cincinnati area. So already by the time the original church was built here in 1842, uh, at least one quarter of the population of Covington was considered to be German Catholics. Mother of God was one of the first German-American Catholic churches to form a benevolent organization to support the religious as well as social needs of the immigrants. They were not only houses of religious worship, they were places where people would congregate and be among their own. This is where they learned to be good Americans and still hold on to something from their own past. Another example of the architecture of Walter and Stewart, the exterior is designed in an Italian Renaissance style. Now, if you look at it on the interior, it almost looks very Baroque in style because it's replete with all kinds of frescoes and artwork and murals, taking up almost literally every inch of the floor and the ceiling and the walls. The church includes murals by Johann Schmidt, who worked for the Covington Altar Stock Building Company, founded in 1862. This company produced altars, altar pieces, paintings, all kinds of ecclesiastical art all over the United States. And they employed, at that time, Johann Schmidt, who had come to the United States from Germany in 1848. He was really the first teacher of Covington artist Frank Duvenac, who himself became internationally renowned. So Duvenac got a start in Covington at the Covington Altar Stock Company doing ecclesiastical art. We know that Johann Schmidt, his murals are everywhere in the United States. Mother of God also includes stained glass windows and sculptures by the famous Franz Meyer and Company Studios of Munich, Germany. The parish that is now Cathedral Basilica of the Assumption was founded in 1833 for the Irish Catholics of Covington. Irish churches were often referred to as English-speaking. There were several Irish-American Catholic congregations in the city of Covington. The Cathedral Basilica was one of those. Sometimes there was a bit of a tense relationship between the Irish-Americans and the German-Americans. Um, but, like anything else, those tensions broke down over time as the Irish intermarried with the Germans. Cathedral Basilica of the Assumption is one of the most impressive church buildings in the Midwest. The facade of this magnificent French Gothic structure is modeled after Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Completed in 1910, it took 16 years to build. The Gothic design is noted for its pointed arches, so everywhere you look you see pointed arches. And because the technology of the Gothic allowed the buildings to absolutely soar, they could be penetrated with a lot of stained glass, bringing light into the interior. The basilica displays spectacular stained glass. The windows, like those in Mother of God, were made by Meyer and Company of Munich, Germany, 
The windows are absolutely fabulous in this cathedral. There are over 79 windows, and they range in size from very small to the rose windows, which are 26 feet in diameter, and the great window, which is 67 feet tall and 24 feet wide, and which is one of the world's largest stained glass windows. Cathedral Basilica is also adorned with exquisite Venetian glass mosaics, murals by Duvenek, and sculptures by Clement Barnhorn. There are a series of four paintings by Frank Duvenek in the Blessed Sacrament Chapel here, and they were installed in 1910 in memory of Frank Duvenek's mother. Frank Duvenek, of course, was a renowned American artist, and he taught for many years at the Cincinnati Art Academy. Alongside was his friend, Clement Barnhorn, who was trained at the Cincinnati Art Academy, studied under the great sculptor in Cincinnati, Henry Fry, and taught for many years at Cincinnati Art Academy. Basilica is a designation given by the Vatican to churches that stand out because of their historical, cultural, or artistic significance. Cathedral Basilica of the Assumption is the only basilica in the greater Cincinnati area. As early as the 1830s, wealthy residents who could afford a carriage sought refuge from the crowded and polluted Cincinnati basin by moving to country estates on hilltops, such as Mount Auburn. The hilltop suburbs of Cincinnati, which were before the Civil War largely farms and estates for the wealthy, became accessible largely through the inclined plane and improved transportation after the Civil War. And so many people, those who could afford to, tended to move from the basin up to the hilltop. Wealthy industrialists helped underwrite the construction of a new church at the north end of Auburn Avenue in 1869. The Mount Auburn Presbyterian Church is one of the glories of late Victorian architecture in Cincinnati. It's remarkably intact inside and outside. Mount Auburn Presbyterian Church is an excellent example of the robust Richardsonian Romanesque revival style. Known for its bold massing, rich stone, intense colors and fine materials and craftsmanship. The present building was designed by H.E. Siter, who was one of the most brilliant Richardsonian Romanesque architects in the Cincinnati area in the late 19th century. The innovative plan has a fan-shaped nave elaborately carved golden oak woodwork, and beautiful windows. Interior details follow a Gothic design simplified and made bold in a Richardsonian way. The cross-shaped form of the church on the interior is emphasized by the absolutely spectacular truss work and the four main trusses that meet on the diagonal in the center suspend a great chandelier, which must be very close to what was here original, very Richardsonian in character. One of the most unusual features of the church is that almost all the interior wall surfaces are tongue and groove boards. Stained glass windows on three sides give Mount Auburn Presbyterian's oak interior a rich golden glow. Clifton United Methodist Church is also designed in the Richardsonian Romanesque form and is another example of a church designed by Crapsey and Brown, according to the Akron Plan. Because Akron Plan churches uh, usually had rooms with such interesting shapes, very often the ceilings moved up into those shapes and they were further emphasized by great uh, wooden trusses, timber work coming from the corners to the center. Though hidden in the roof, the church still retains the partition and pulley system that was used to separate the Sunday school from the sanctuary. Clifton United Methodist Church also has important stained glass windows. On one side, the windows have just newly been confirmed to have been designed by John Lafarge, who was a great Boston artist and one of the inventors of the Tiffany style of stained glass windows. 
The other great window was apparently a collaboration between Maitland Armstrong and his daughter Helen Armstrong. They also often worked and collaborated with Lafarge and they used Lafarge's glass technique and often the same studios and manufacturers, but the approach is quite different. The construction of a railroad linking Cincinnati, Hamilton, and Dayton inspired others with higher means to move even farther out. Glendale, a picturesque suburb to the north of Cincinnati, was laid out in 1852 with large lots and curving streets. The community's first families built the Glendale New Church in 1861. With its board and batten siding and steep cross-gabled roof, it's a rare example of the Carpenter Gothic style. It is a wonderful little Gothic revival gem. It has a wonderful intimate worship space on the inside with high ceilings. It's very simple. It has white plaster walls, but it also has lovely little decorative details like the stained glass windows and the fabulously carved pulpit and lectern and other furniture. The church is Swedenborgian basing its beliefs and practices on the writings of Emanuel Swedenborg, a Swedish inventor and philosopher who founded a new type of Christianity. The Swedenborgian church was very popular with artists and writers and intellectuals, and in Cincinnati, its members included artistic woodcarvers like Ben Pittman and Henry Fry and his son William, and they were lifelong members of the church. As the migration of religious and ethnic groups ebbed and flowed, the ownership of religious structures often changed. Toward the end of the 19th century, established Jews began to leave the West End, reacting to the decline of the downtown neighborhood, more crowded conditions, and cultural differences with new immigrants. Many of the newcomers were Orthodox Jews from Eastern Europe and Russia. When they came to Cincinnati, they were seen as poor, religiously conservative and slow to assimilate. Wealthier Jews moved in small numbers to Walnut Hills, then in large waves to Avondale. B'nai Yeshurun and B'nai Israel built new temples in Avondale, following their congregations. By the 1920s, the Eastern European Jews followed the trend, also moving to Avondale. Rabbi Louis Feinberg led the Orthodox Adith Israel congregation in building a grand new synagogue on Reading Road. In 1927, they report that the Orthodox synagogues that have been established in Avondale are full to overflowing, whereas the synagogues downtown are sort of half empty. So you get that sense that by 1927, which is the year that this building was dedicated, the whole range of Jewish population in Cincinnati was concentrated in Avondale. As Jews left the West End, blacks emigrating from the South began to fill in behind them. And the West End becomes, by 1930, really the major African-American community in the metropolitan area. 80% of all African-Americans in the city of Cincinnati live in the West End. We had our own churches, and uh, the church was the mainstay of the African-American community in the West End as it was across the country. Of course, you know, it was highly segregated, and so they became like a city unto themselves. It thrived, it flourished because of the, uh, the need to be together and to stay together and to work together. After World War II, new interstate highways were built, creating opportunities for some and challenges for others. The construction of I-75, coupled with urban renewal in the 1950s and 60s, forced the mass exodus of 30,000 African Americans from Cincinnati's West End. The end of the West End is not like the end of the rest of the basin. The end of the West End is intentional. The city decides to run the expressway right through the middle of it, and then also at the same time to tear down almost the remainder. Urban renewal has been associated with a lot of code words, and we like to use the word urban removal. And it was a, a mass removal 
And uh, that's when we started to disintegrate as a community. Displaced blacks moved to Avondale and Walnut Hills, again filling in behind the Jewish community as they headed to newer suburbs even farther out. A Jewish community study noted that from 1948 to 1958, the Jewish population of South Avondale went from 6,500 to 450. During that time, the housing, the redlining, and all that stuff was going on, so it was a mess. It was a mess. In the 50s and 60s, we had tremendous riots, and it was all because of the removal from where they were, going to new places where they were not accepted and not wanted. African-American congregations sometimes found new homes in recently vacated synagogues and churches. They had to modify uh, those buildings in order to prepare them for the kind of worship that we were accustomed to. There were no choir stands. Well, without a choir in a black church, you can close the door. The Zion Temple First Pentecostal Church was founded in downtown Cincinnati in 1930. In 1973, they moved into the former Isaac M. Wise Center built in 1927 and designed by Feckheimer and Eihorst in the Neo-Romanesque style. The Southern Baptist Church, founded in 1917, lost their home in the West End to urban renewal and moved into the former Adith Israel Synagogue on Reading Road in 1964. I'm sort of like the church. I have no home to go back to. Every home I lived in, in the city of Cincinnati, except my present home, has been torn down. <laughs> uh, I lived on Liberty Street, and that's gone. I lived on 9th Street, and that's gone. I lived on Hopkins Street, and that's gone. I lived on Winchell Avenue, and that's gone. I lived on Herbert when I first got married, and that's gone. I lived on Greg right after my baby was born, and that's gone. <laughs> When I took on the project of learning about this building, it was because it seems like this was going to be our permanent home and we could have an old history and a new beginning. Built in 1926, the building still retains many traces of its original use as a Jewish synagogue. The centerpiece, is a 100-foot dome that includes a stained-glass Star of David and a 2,200-pound bronze chandelier. There's an inscription over the door in Hebrew, and this is one of the uh, things that was covered up at the time of the deconsecration with uh, cement. But that cement has fallen away, and the Hebrew letters are now once more visible. And the Hebrew above the door means the gateway to the Lord. This reuse of Jewish temples and other church properties by the black community was a trend that had already been well established. Allen Temple is one of the oldest African American congregations in Cincinnati. Parishioners who organized it had separated from the Deer Creek Methodist Church in 1824 because they were no longer willing to sit in segregated pews. When the Jewish congregation of B'nai Israel moved from downtown to the West End in 1870, the African Methodist Episcopal Church moved into the exotic, Spanish-inspired synagogue they left behind. The new owners renamed it Allen Temple, in honor of the founder and first bishop of the AME Church, Richard Allen. The Allen Temple was the oldest synagogue and the oldest black church left in Cincinnati when it was torn down in 1979 for the expansion of Procter & Gamble's headquarters. Today, the Allen Temple congregation worships in a bold new building in Bond Hill. <laughs> Union Baptist Church is the oldest black congregation remaining in downtown Cincinnati. Founded in 1831, Union Baptist owned four historic church buildings all demolished as the city grew. Their current church at Central and West 7th Street was built in 1970. African-American churches like Allen Temple and Union Baptist Church 
have a long history of promoting social change. The churches were key leaders in encouraging anti-slavery efforts, providing schools, and promoting business opportunities for blacks. In the mid-20th century, churches played an important role in the civil rights movement. Cincinnati minister Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, founder and pastor of New Light Baptist Church from 1966 to 2006, was an instrumental civil rights leader who helped to develop the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. The church is the origin of the civil rights movement. The church was the place you went to to have your rallies. If there were problems in the neighborhoods relating it to racism or discrimination, you had nowhere else to meet, you go to the church. The 20th century brought new immigrants and new interpretations of traditional forms. Holy Trinity St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Church was organized in 1907. The current church was built in 1972. Though clearly modern, it manifests many aspects of traditional Byzantine architecture. New ideas in religion and aesthetics led to profound changes in the architecture and design of sacred spaces. St. John's Unitarian Universalist Church in Clifton is an old congregation that embraced a new style in the mid-20th century. St. John's features a white exterior envelope with many slender spires. The church has a unique modern work by Harry Bertoia, entitled Joy, It Glitters in the Sun on Winter Solstice. The oratory at Grailville and Loveland is refashioned from an 1813 dairy barn. It was created in 1962 by sculptor and designer William Schickel and architects Garber, Tweddle, and Wheeler. As I sat in this space, and just as you can see with the sunlight today, the walls light and moves around, I thought to myself, this could be categorized as frugal splendor. Frugal splendor just kept pounding into my head as I sat here and thought. Grailville was stressing a strong spiritual life and a simplicity in the material world. And this really embraced that idea in a concrete form. The design was influenced by Vatican II, a reform within the Catholic Church that brought about extensive changes in worship styles and church buildings. So working on the oratory was before Vatican II actually was accomplished, but the ideas were already in the air and the people at Grailville were very much part of that thinking. So actually the place here with the mass facing the people was probably one of the first ones done in the world. As some of our most familiar landmarks, sacred spaces bring beauty, identity, and a sense of place to our neighborhoods. But as people continue to leave older urban neighborhoods, redundant religious properties are often left empty. When St. John's Unitarian Church moved to Clifton in 1955, it sold its old church in Over the Rhine to a black congregation, but the building now stands empty. 
The former St. Paul's German Evangelical Church has been empty for decades. It still bears its German credo, meaning truth, virtue, freedom. Other historic church buildings have been adapted for new uses. St. Pius in South Cumminsville has become the headquarters for working in neighborhoods, an important community resource center. St. Paul's Catholic Church in Over the Rhine was converted by the Virgin Bell Company into their corporate offices in 1981. The former sanctuary maintains its public presence as an event center. The third Protestant Memorial Church in Coryville was converted to an urban outfitter's clothing store. Old St. George was reborn as an ecumenical center in 1995, but recently closed again, its future now uncertain. Countless historic sacred spaces have already been lost to the wrecking ball. Though listed in the National Register, Walnut Hills Presbyterian Church was demolished in 2003. When churches are demolished, sometimes it's a permanent loss. There was a church, uh, the Holy Trinity Church, that was on West Fifth Street um, that had Duvenek murals uh, that were on plaster uh, on the walls. There was no way to salvage them. So when the church was torn down for construction of Interstate 75, these priceless murals were, were gone. But preservation is not easy. Historic sacred spaces require special efforts to maintain. They are not only expensive to maintain, they're expensive to heat and to air condition as well, but they're one of a kind. And we've lost and we are still losing so many of them. And the legacy of their art and architecture is something that really we can't afford to lose. They say so much about our past and about our aspirations and our priorities that it's very important to maintain them, not only as living organisms, as churches, if we can, but if we can't, as buildings, which tell us something about our legacy. With continuing immigration from all over the world, houses of worship have become important social and cultural centers for diverse peoples. The Hindu Temple of Greater Cincinnati, whose domes are inspired by Northern Indian architecture, is unique. It houses 16 deities, making it as diverse as Cincinnati's growing Hindu population. It may be America's first non-denominational Hindu temple. In the late 1960s, a few Muslims living in the Cincinnati area began to gather for prayer. Since then, their numbers have grown and three congregations have been established in the Cincinnati area. The largest of these is the Islamic Center of Cincinnati in suburban Westchester, completed in 1995. The mosque, built in the shape of an eight-pointed star, includes elements of Omeyyad and Moorish design and features a large gold dome that attracts the attention of many travelers on I-75. The dome was actually barred from the Byzantine period in order to cover the wide open space, which is essentially what a mosque provides. And some of the very early mosques were actually open-aired mosques, but as Islam traveled throughout the world, um, the dome became a necessity. Inside the Islamic Center, a spectacular chandelier hangs from the center of the gold dome. It's a specially fabricated lighter material than even crystal, and even then it weighs over two tons. And so I think it competes for probably the largest chandeliers in Cincinnati. The jewel-like skylights and windows were made by Beauvais in Middletown. They're of geometric design because Islam does not allow figurative images. The sanctuary also features ornamentation and calligraphy based on the Quran. So the various forms of calligraphy that you see written in different artistic styles are words of God taken from the Quran and then written in various beautiful methods. The congregation at the Islamic Center is very diverse. They're almost as colorful as the flags that are draping the reflecting pond on the entrance to the center in the sense that they're anywhere from the good old USA to Africa to Europe to Asia to Indonesia. So we really get uh, kind of a United Nations in here. Like most mosques, 
The Islamic Center includes a minaret. The minaret is there to allow people to know that it's a mosque and that they can come here to pray. And it was a very functional element of the mosque in the olden days where somebody actually climbed to the top of the minaret to do the adhan or the call for prayer. But our minaret is more of a symbol and an icon. Westchester doesn't want to be called to prayer five times a day, so the adhan or the call for prayer is said from inside the mosque and people are given a, a few moments to gather for the congregational prayer. Widespread suburban growth has brought about another contemporary trend in sacred spaces, the megachurch. These fast-growing churches require ample auditorium seating, huge parking lots, and easy access to interstate interchanges. As religious spaces, their structures take non-traditional forms, many bearing closer resemblance to performance halls and meeting centers than typical churches. The Vineyard Community Church, which began with 37 people meeting in a barn, welcomes about 5,000 members per week to its center near Tri-County Mall. Led by several dozen pastors, the church blends contemporary music, media, and lively sermons into its services. The interdenominational Crossroads Community Church in Oakley adapted a big box retail structure to fit their needs transforming an old HQ hardware store into church space for more than 8,000 members per week. Contemporary churches like Crossroads and The Vineyard boast some of the fastest growing congregations in the country. Whether old and historic, adapted and reused, or unconventional and new. Sacred spaces hold special meaning for us as individuals and communities. Whether it's a small English-style parish church or a Roman basilica or a vertically towering German church, these are all expressions of the cultures that produced them. And they say so much more to the mind and the spirit if we know how to read them, if we know how to walk into them and let them talk to us. Sacred spaces tell the story of our ancestors. They hold treasures of ages gone by. They bring beauty to our landscape and identity to our neighborhoods and hold open doors to our spiritual lives. Sacred spaces represent a legacy of architecture, history, and art that reveals clues to our essential nature as human beings. Steeples and spires, statues and stained glass. For as long as they stand, sacred spaces will reflect our highest aspirations and remain beacons in our lives. Sacred Spaces was made possible with generous contributions from Carl H. Lindner, the Ohio Humanities Council, the Josephine S. Russell Charitable Trust, the Fine Arts Fund, GBBN Architects, 
and with generous support from CET and the Voyager Media Group production team.